The study of science fiction literature remains an intriguing and evolving part of literary criticism. Although its study is increasing in academia, particularly in the United States, it remains a reasonably marginalised area of literature for many academic institutions within the United Kingdom, with only a mere handful of courses offered as part of language and literature modules. While science fiction works appear in any number of literary courses, they are often placed inappropriately in a context outside that defined by the genre, and more often than not these works are labelled as something other than science fiction. Nevertheless, its study through the work of authors and critics in journals such as Foundation, the International Review of Science Fiction, Science Fiction Studies, the SFRA Review, and Extrapolation, continues to thrive, although it would be difficult to find these journals in most university libraries. The oldest existing organisation which promotes the study and research of science fiction literature, film and other media, is the Science Fiction Research Association, founded in 1970. The University of Kansas in the United States of America continues to be a leader in the study of science fiction, as does the University of Liverpool here in the United Kingdom, home to the Science Fiction Foundation collection in the special collections and archives housed in the Sydney Jones Library. In choosing a topic for my thesis, and deciding to pursue my interest in science fiction literature, after some research, I was mildly startled to discover little work had been undertaken on one of science fiction's most notable authors, namely Frank Herbert. Herbert would be considered as part of a group of authors known as the Big Four, together with Isaac Asimov, Robert A. Heinlein, and Sir Arthur C. Clarke. This association was not from any joint efforts, but rather from the fact that these four authors became household names, primarily with the sales of their books, as opposed to the previously traditional means in 20th century science fiction of pulp and magazine publications. Of this select group, it is fair to say that Herbert stands apart from the other three because of a small number of distinctions. Firstly, Asimov and Clark were renowned scientists, a professor of biochemistry and a physicist respectively while Heinlein worked as an aeronautical engineer during World War II. Herbert, who had many scientific interests, was a journalist who could be best described as an enthusiastic amateur when it came to any technical or scientific expertise. Secondly, and possibly more notably, Herbert is the least prolific of the four authors, which might seem strange as he was the only professional journalist. It is possibly for this reason that Herbert and his works remain relatively ignored by science fiction criticism, though this is also true of his fellow authors in the Big Four. Herbert is notable above the others for his identification with one particular novel, Dune, published in 1965, and the five novels that followed in the series. Dune is as big a science fiction novel as one can find, big in size, big in sales, big in popularity, big in intellect and big in fame. It is considered to be one of the greatest science fiction novels of all time, often marketed this way, and its regard was high from its initial publication and continues to be so in the present day. Dune made Frank Herbert's reputation equal to that of Asimov, Heinlein and Clark. Herbert's status as a great science fiction writer was really achieved through one work, while the others churned out novel after novel and wrote prolific numbers of short stories. The Dune series is a complicated and vast story of political intrigue, war, revenge, evolution, and most notably, ecology on a planetary scale. Within science fiction literature, there are few planets depicted in such a vivid and detailed manner as the world of Arrakis, also known as Dune. Dune's intellectual complexity and vast timescale are what most likely prevent this work of science fiction from coming under serious study. Yet it is Frank Herbert's intricacy as a writer, the varied and intertwined themes, Byzantine intrigues, and the detailed characterization that ultimately have drawn my attention to the Dune series as a focus of research. Dune is praised and criticised alike for its scope, but in terms of criticism, it receives remarkably little attention that covers the range of the entire series. One of the inherent problems with science fiction criticism is revealed when examining the scant attention that Dune receives, 
in that such undertakings often show a degree of bias within the field. The focus of such criticism is often to question Dune's validity as a work of science fiction. It is also frequently asked whether Dune falls within the soft or hard categories of the genre, and to question if it has diluted its content of traditional science fiction tropes by the inclusion of mysticism. Mysticism is portrayed as part of one of the dominant themes in Dune, namely humanity's messianic impulses. More specific criticism is levelled towards Herbert's accuracy in his portrayal of ecology as a science, and the various forms of evolution and genetic engineering that are fundamental to the universe he created. I will show that such criticism is often flawed and tainted with the bias of such critics who often seek to promote their own works through such detractions. My intention is to examine the Dune series as a collective, and ask why it remains such an important work in the science fiction catalogue, while at the same time questioning why it seems to stand alone within the genre. In doing so, I shall focus on the inherent themes and Herbert's deliberate intent in weaving them together to make a dense tapestry of a story that operates on so many levels. My intention is to question Dune's apparent isolation in science fiction and to make an argument for it being a novel that creates an important bridge between the traditional golden age of science fiction and the more radical new wave of the mid to late 1960s and 1970s. I intend to show that not only is Dune a Janus facing work, but also that through the presentation of its major themes, it is quietly subversive to not only the social and political attitudes of its time, but especially so towards science fiction as a genre. In that sense, albeit praised by authors and fans alike, there is something strange and esoteric about the Dune series, making it difficult to categorise and place within the canon of science fiction. Although there are a number of approaches to science fiction criticism, a historical and cultural perspective serves best here, in consideration of William Tuponce's already existing work on Dune from a linguistic point of view, where he examines it as a polyphonic novel. A beginning is the time for taking the most delicate care that the balances are correct. I will always remember the first science fiction book that I bought through a school-sponsored book club. It was a collection of short stories by Arthur C. Clarke called Of Time and Stars, and it contained two of my all-time favourite stories, An Ape About the House and The Nine Billion Names of God. As I glanced through the Puffin Book Club catalogue, I circled an image of a novel's cover, deciding that it would be the one I would choose. The wonderful cover by Peter Jones immediately captured my imagination. A spaceman weeping in his suit at the destruction of some interstellar paradise. This was the first of many introductions to fantastical literature, which included works by H.G. Wells, Jules Verne and J.R.R. Tolkien. When I read of Time and Stars, I began with the foreword by J.B. Priestley, which was my introduction to science fiction as a genre. Here, Priestley talked about the kinds of science fiction he didn't like, namely those that created an effect, where there was nothing surprising in the futures they create, and others that merely mimicked the Western novel. This was in essence why he endorsed Arthur C. Clarke's collection of short stories, for everything in this small tome not only surprised me, but made me believe that these strange new worlds of the future were possible. There seemed to be, in a sense, a truth that although wasn't real now, could become plausible in the near or distant future. Priestley puts this down to the two qualities that as he saw it, a successful science fiction writer needed to possess. While scientific and technological knowledge are important for a writer of science fiction, there is something he must have to be really worth reading that is far more important. He must have imagination, and this must not be confused with mere fanciful invention. Many years later, my introduction to the works of Frank Herbert began by reading Dune when I was studying science fiction literature for a postgraduate degree at the University of Liverpool. At this time, it was some 12 years after Frank Herbert's death following a short battle with pancreatic cancer. 
Through discussions with both students and lecturers alike, I came to discover the high regard in which he was held as a science fiction writer, but in particular the high esteem in which his novel Dune was held. This unusual and complex novel was by a general consensus amongst the students, the pinnacle of science fiction, the standard that other sci-fi writers should aspire to. It was notable not just for being considered one of the finest examples of the genre, but was also seen as the best-selling science fiction novel of all time. Curiosity drew me in, and I had soon read all six books in the Dune series, mortified to find it unfinished before Frank Herbert's death. As a work of varied motifs and a particular intelligence behind it, I find myself learning many lessons from its pages, both about the world around me and about myself as well. With both critical acclaim and financial success, why then, I wondered, were we not studying Frank Herbert's Dune series? On reviewing Frank Herbert's entry in one of the earlier editions of the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, I soon found that I was curiously enough not the only person to ask this question. Malcolm J. Edwards pointed out that his work has been subject to remarkably little critical analysis, while William Tuponce, in his linguistically focused study on Herbert's Dune series, is also surprised by the little attention paid to an author of his stature. Given the size of his readership, both within and without the academic community, and the fact of Herbert's enormous popularity, it is surprising to learn then he has received very little critical attention. When browsing through some back issues of Foundation, the International Review of Science Fiction, I decided to look back to the time of Frank Herbert's death, and backtrack through the journals to see exactly what had been written about his work. At a time when science fiction was losing a number of prominent writers, most notably Theodore Sturgeon, L. Ron Hubbard and Frank Herbert all within a short time of each other, I was curious to see what was being said of these writers, with death generally being a spur to see academic interest invested in an author's work. Edward James's editorial in Foundation, shortly after the time of Frank Herbert's death in 1986, describes Herbert together with L. Ron Hubbard as the two science fiction writers who have caught the public eye more than almost any others, the first with what I suppose the most successful science fiction novel of the last 20 years, and the second with the most successful science fiction religion. Edward James leaves the body of his editorial, paradoxically, to a brief discussion on L. Ron Hubbard. The reason for this being he firmly believed Foundation, in the light of the subject matter that the journal focused upon, would not be inclined to show too much future interest in L. Ron Hubbard. This was due to the bizarre religious direction that Hubbard's work had turned towards, namely Dianetics, and the subsequent arrival and development of the Church of Scientology. Frank Herbert's death would certainly provide an impetus to discussing his works and impact on the genre in future journals, and therefore James promptly ignores him in the assured belief of future commentary. It falls to an additional note by Ian Watson, the features editor of Foundation at the time, to note the lack of any critical overview of Frank Herbert's vision and the tendency to concentrate on other prominent or controversial writers. He ends his brief discussion with a hopeful and optimistic call to arms for future academics to give this notable writer some serious consideration for study. To those critics and universities seeking future topics, we urge a spirit of adventure. Let them launch their boats into the still largely uncharted water of Herbert's world, perhaps. Sadly, both Edward James's sense of the obvious and Ian Watson's desire for academics to set forth and enter these uncharted waters of Herbert's literary visions are mostly unfulfilled. With few academic analyses of Herbert's work, it is for this reason that I have decided to follow Mr. Watson's urgings and examine Herbert's most notable contribution to science fiction in an attempt to address this oversight. 